Jody is interviewed first. Her demeanor is initially upbeat. She's chatty with Detective Royce. When he asks about the murder, she says, yeah, I've heard about it. Heard about it on the news. But she hasn't been there at that apartment since a few days before the murder happened. <coughs> Detective Royce keeps listening to her. She even tells him that she believes that her and Greenwell were the intended targets. That people are looking for her. She's spinning a lie to a detective that already knows the truth. He confronts her with that truth. He shows her a video of a survivor of Daryl Wilson. At that point, her demeanor changes instantaneously. Her head drops and the jig is up. So then we have the statement that she gives after <coughs> she's confronted with what Detective Royce already knows to be true. She admits that she was there. She never entered the bedroom, but she heard a pop. <coughs> she looked in and she saw Daryl Wilson's body shaking on the bed. His body was shaking and instead of calling for help, she ran to her apartment, put on clothes, and went to the casino just to be somewhere, to be anywhere but the murder scene. She only returned days later in the middle of the night and got what she could, leaving most of her belongings behind, never to be seen again. Next. We have Brian Greenwell. Same thing. He tells Detective Royce that he and Jody were the ones that were supposed to be shot. He even goes so far as to try to steer the blame to some black dudes from Chicago. People are following him. <coughs> Detective Royce continues to give Greenwell the opportunity to tell the truth but he keeps up his lies. He tells Detective Royce that he didn't return to the apartment for a couple of days because he thought the killing was meant for him and Jody Cecil. Again, it's not until after he's shown a video of Daryl Wilson that the story changes. So he admits the things that he cannot deny. He was there. He went into the apartment to help. And the gun went off. It went off again and again and again. Four times the gun went off. Four times. Four headshots. He tells Detective Royce, that he blacked out. The gun that was used in the commission of that crime, well, Brian Greenwell tossed that gun in Tom Wallace Lake at Jefferson Memorial Forest. He told Detective Royce in his interview that he melted the gun down. It was not until a month later, in August, that Detective Royce learned from another individual, not Jody Cecil, not Brian Greenwell, that the gun was submerged in a lake in Fairdale. On August 23rd, the LMPD dive team went out and successfully recovered the gun.
The gun was sent off for ballistics testing, and those projectiles and those shell casings that were recovered on the scene were a match. They were fired from that weapon. Nobody called 911, not Jody Cecil, not Brian Greenwell. They left Daryl Wilson for dead. His body was shaking as he bled out the back of his skull. And they didn't call 911. Daryl laid there from about 10, 1030 in the morning until after 6 p.m. when Robert Hayes found him. Eight hours. He suffered an injury that will affect him for the rest of his life. He has no use of his lower body. He is confined to a bed in a care facility where he has been at for the last two years and remains at to this day. But he's lucky to be alive. Jennifer didn't share that same love. She's not here to tell us what happened. But her injuries reveal a horrific end to her life. During the autopsy, the medical examiner uncovered three gunshot wounds to the left side of her face, two by her ear, and one right underneath her eye. The bullets traveled in different directions, from left to right and up, from left to right and down. Inconsistent with an accident. The bullets that tore through Jennifer's skull were intentional. She died at the hands of Brian Greenwell with the help of Jody Cecil. Had Detective Royce and his investigative team not done a thorough job Jody Cecil and Brian Greenwell would have left this go on forever. But the time that they be held accountable has come. And at the end of the Commonwealth's case, after the evidence is presented to you, after we have proven the case beyond a reasonable doubt, I will ask you to return the only just verdict that is guilty guilty of the senseless murder of Jennifer Kane, guilty of the attempted murder and the assault of Daryl Wilson, and guilty of tampering with that gun when he tossed it in the lake. Thank you, Ms. Dungeon. Would you uh, put the flap down on it? Thank you very much. All right, Ms. Erskine. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, again, my name is Heather Erskine. I represent Brian Greenwell. Um, that was a lot. I'm just going to repeat a few things. This week, you're going to hear about a tragic event that happened May 13th, 2016. It was tragic, and it is sad. A woman was killed and a man was shot. A man and a woman stand before you faced with charges of murder and assault. But Brian Greenwell is not guilty of murdering Jennifer Kane, and he is not guilty of assaulting or attempting to murder Daryl Wilson. You're going to hear a lot of evidence this week. You're going to hear from a lot of witnesses. It may come together to a story that makes sense, or more likely, you'll be left with some questions. I don't think any of us can ever really know what happened in that bedroom. But as we talked about in voir dire, it's their burden to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that this was murder, intentional or otherwise, and that it was intentional assault. The beginning of this story is the same. It's undisputed. 
Jennifer Kane and Daryl Wilson lived in an apartment on Shelby Street. Um, she just showed you a photograph of that apartment, 1133 Shelby. There was two apartments in that building. One was Jennifer Kane and Daryl Wilson, and the other was Jody Cecil and Brian Greenwell. The people involved in this case were neighbors. <clears throat> Jennifer and Jody were friends. In fact, knowing Jennifer is how Jody came to live in the apartment. Jennifer vouched for Jody to her landlord, and yeah, that is. I'm in the approach. 